the session is on the topic of using data as a catalyst for digital transformation. My name is Keith Turner and together with my colleague Keith Phillip will be hosting this evening's event. Before we get started I'd like to cover a few items so that you know how to participate this evening. Now the event is being recorded. If you do not wish to attend a recorded event please disconnect now. As this is a webinar your mic will remain muted and your webcam disconnected during the event. The event duration will be no longer than one hour. If you have questions, please submit these by using the Q&A function in your Zoom control panel and directing your question to my co-host, Keith Phillip. Keith will collate these and then address them to our panelists at the end of the evening's event. If a question you wish to ask has already been submitted, you may use the upvote option to register your interest. Please do not use the chat option to submit your questions as these may not be picked up. So I'd now like to introduce our panellist today, Nick Granger. With a degree in Business Information Systems and an MBA from Warwick Business School, Nick's focused her career on data and analysis, process improvements and leadership of transformation programmes, both with digital, data and technology and finance. Amongst other achievements, she led a team who launched the National Data Repository, our first in the UK providing open industry data to encourage use of innovative technologies such as machine learning and artificial intelligence. Nick, a warm welcome and over to you. Thanks very much, Keith. So uh, as Keith said, I'm Nick Granger. I'm the Director of Corporate for the Oil and Gas Authority. So I was gonna start with a, a short explanation as to why you're hearing from the Oil and Gas Authority in the Wiltshire branch. So I'm actually a West Country girl. I'm, I'm living in Wiltshire. We have our head office in Aberdeen and another office in London. So I'm in the group of people that are enjoying not doing the commute at present. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about using data as a catalyst for digital transformation, driving culture change, and how we've gone about doing that as an organization. So just as a starter, as to who the OGA are. So we were created in 2015 off the back of a review by Surrey and Wood of the oil and gas sector in the UK. Our role is to regulate and influence the UK oil and gas industry. We see ourselves as a value creator and the main purpose being to maximize economic recovery of resources whilst also supporting the industry through the energy transition move to net zero carbon by 2050. As you can see on the, the cube on the right, in terms of our influence and regulate powers, we draw on data and digital quite a lot, in particular in terms of performance monitoring and benchmarking. So the information on this slide is a bit out of date now, as you'll see, this was a forward look from 2017, but I think it's an important place to start in terms of the importance of data to the UK economy. So quite often in organisations, we jump to talking about digital, um, exciting sort of technology, AI, machine learning, but actually the place that we can add the value is from the underlying data that makes it possible to use those types of technology. So a little bit now in terms of how we as an organization have used data to change culture in the industry that we regulate and influence and look to do digital transformation, both internally for ourselves as an organization, but also encourage the wider sector to do the same. So off the back of the Wood Review in 2014, we were essentially given the mandate to say to the industry that data is a critical asset and should be used to try and add value across the UK. We created powers in legislation in 2016 that gave us the ability to require industry to report certain data to us as an organization, for us to retain that data, and then also the power for us to disclose that data publicly, openly and freely after a certain confidentiality period. So that actually gave us some very key powers to be able to use as a basis for digital transformation in the basin. Our starting point though was to make sure we had the right team in place. So we've created a digital and data and technology team essentially from scratch that 
starts from a data, data policy angle and it goes all the way up through to a development teams producing digital products, but also in between that, a data compliance team that actually makes sure that we've got quality data in place. So some of the early actions, and I'll talk about these in a bit more detail, detail as we go on, was to create an open data site. So this is a GIS system, a geographical information system that contains data that the OGA has created and also some data that we have collected from industry. And it looks at this data in a spatial point of view, a lot of maps and a lot of information in there that people can access through the website to actually do analysis themselves. The National Data Repository that was mentioned earlier was a first for the UK. It's another system that holds data that's been reported to us from industry and makes it publicly available. Another of our early uh, actions and perhaps a good thing from this news this morning was that we got a delegation to not be on gov.uk website. What that's meant is that we've been able to maintain our own web access and our own site, which enables a huge range of data systems to be driven from one place. We knew though, after creating these powers and the team to be able to use those powers that we weren't going to be able to convince both our own organization and industry of the importance of, of data until we could show them what it could do for them. So one of our early moves was to work on benchmarking so that we had a um, open to us the ability to talk to the managing directors of all, all of the industry companies and compare them and benchmark them against each other. That made it very clear to people in, in leadership roles at a very early stage that data quality was important and actually could help them. It could help them make business decisions that they didn't have the evidence to make earlier on. The final thing on this slide then is the next step for us. So in 2020, we issued our five-year digital strategy. This is essentially our strategic vision of data and digital for us as an organization, but also the industry as to how we can best use data through digital solutions to make better business decisions and outcomes. So our digital strategy is essentially to create value for the OGA industry and stakeholders through digital data and technology. We have five pillars in the strategy and I'll talk through those in a moment. The first of those is intentionally first and that is people, skills and culture. Until you've got the people in place with the right skills, the right capability, it's very difficult to move on to the later sort of technology aspects of digital transformation because you can't make the most out, out of that digital transformation. The second area there in terms of transforming access to information, if you can't get at your data and information, then it is also, again, very difficult to use AI or machine learning to do fun things with if you don't have the best quality data in the right place. Analytics and intelligence, we talk about how we can actually use the data that we've been able to uncover and access. And as a relatively small organization, certainly in government terms, for us, our strategy is based around collaboration and partnership, drawing in the right skills and specialisms to the organization as and when we need them. Whilst also making sure that we've got a really good feedback loop with our users to make small and, and larger adjustments to our systems and processes to be able to improve them. The final pillar is more out, outward looking for us. So the, the first four being primarily inward looking. The fifth one talks more about how we can influence industry to make better use of data themselves. And off the back of that data, be able to implement digital transformation projects. So looking at the, the first pillar of people, skills and culture, the first aspect of this that we looked at was around the use of Agile. So our digital development teams have been using Agile as a methodology for quite a long time. What we wanted to do, though, was take the advantages and the benefits we'd seen from working using Agile in a project sense of, of IT development into the wider organisation. So we've trained the whole organization in Agile from the chief executive through the leadership team and the full staff team as well. 
we've seen two benefits from doing that. Firstly, people have been able to use Agile for non-digital projects in a way that enables them to prioritize and feel they have the ownership of those projects. But the second advantage to it is it's demystified some of the IT tech terminology that the digital and data teams have been using in the digital transformation projects across the organization. So people don't worry when, when the technical team talks to them and perhaps slightly more technical talks of sprints and scrums and all these kind of words which people don't associate uh, with project terminology. The second aspect here is our digital academy. So we've recently launched this. It's an internal academy. And essentially what it does is provide people with access to awareness and training programs to be able to build their own digital skills. So whilst this started with the digital and data and technology teams, it's widened now to the full organization. The big driver we've been asked uh, quite a lot to produce is Power BI training. So people know that the data is there, they want to be able to access that themselves. So the Digital Academy, we've now got make sure that we point people in the right place to existing courses and also highlight where there's a need to customize training internally as well. When we're talking about culture, we made sure very early on to get leadership buy-in and we've been very lucky that our leadership team and board understand data and the, the value that can be created by it. But we wanted to make sure that we got that buy-in across the organization. So we've created a group called the Digital Champions Group. It's an informal group. The only criteria to be a member of it is that you are interested in an aspect of digital data or technology that you want to innovate and share your ideas with others. So this group meets on an ad hoc basis. It looks at at small business problems, looks for solutions. It also has a learning aspect to it. So we recently did a hackathon where the team picked up a particular issue that one team was having in the business. A number of people that were in the digital champions came along to the extent of there were individuals from outside the digital and data team who came along for a couple of days and actually learned some Python coding during that time that was able to help the particular problem that they were dealing with, but also gave them the ability to take those skills back into their own area and use them in the future. In terms of transforming access to information, so I, I said earlier in terms of making sure you've got the data is crucial to be able to do digital transformation. We've essentially got two systems at the moment, the NDR and our open data site that hold industry and OGA data. Having those in place and making sure that the data is freely and openly available is key for our point of view in terms of driving digitalization across the basin and the UK sector. We've worked very hard to make sure that that is accessible. So previously the data was there, but in different places. We've now got APIs set up and the, the spatial uh, representation I was talking about earlier that enables people to access that data in different ways and be sure that they're getting a consistent data source. One thing we do know, though, is that we've got, firstly, we've got two systems. It's quite difficult if you're an external user to understand why there are two different data systems. So one thing we're working on at the moment is essentially a single entry point for that data, one overall digital energy platform that people can use to access our data and interact with it in different ways to make sure they've got a way to personalize their own experience and use the data that they want to. I talked at the beginning about our data regulations. We continue to refresh these in terms of the guidance that they support. And this is going to be a, an ever growing area for us as an organization as we start to support the industry through energy transition towards net zero in 2050, making sure that we've got the data regulations in place that enables us to collect key data from industry that other subsectors of the energy and industry might use to be able to forward the agenda relating to renewables and new technologies. 
The next point in terms of making sure that we use data as a catalyst for digital transformation is on analytics and intelligence. Now, I'm sure, given the audience, that none of you would disagree that data quality is the key to anything that you do with, with data or digital systems. There is nothing new about garbage in, garbage out. But this is where we spend quite a lot of our time in terms of ensuring compliance against our regulations, ensuring that the data we've been submitted is in the right format. For example, that someone's just not renamed a file um, with a PDF ending on the file name to be able to get to submit it. So we do a lot of quality checking and compliance to make sure that the data that we've got is actually of a high quality. Without that data quality, you can't do the next bits in terms of analytics and intelligence. So I talked a bit previously about the APIs. This means that industry and academia and the public can interact with our data on a live basis rather than waiting to download data from one week to the next. When we first started, we wanted to make sure that we got buy-in from the wider leadership in the sector. And one of the ways that we did that was to take the data that we had collected and start to make that publicly available through a variety of dynamic dashboards. We also did this internally in slightly more detail, greater level of detail so that colleagues could actually use the data that we've got to undertake analysis and get a greater understanding of the industry. We've used these dynamic dashboards in meetings that we hold regularly, our chief exec and the managing directors of the operators to make sure that they can understand the industry in terms of some of the key metrics that are mentioned there on the slide, but also for the benchmarking. So we can show industry at any one time how they compare to their colleagues and their peers and also how their metrics compare. One thing that we're working on at the moment, though, is around data warehousing. So whilst this is relatively new, created in 2015, we do have quite a large legacy behind us. So our data goes back to the 1960s when the first production and exploration was starting. We also have a variety of organisations that we have been a part of, and therefore a whole range of legacy systems, and transactional systems in particular, that contain or generate data. So we're working at the moment to make sure that we've got one consistent data source, that we've got an infrastructure that supports that, that is also adaptable to new technologies. And we're doing that through a data warehousing, which will then link in to our business intelligence tools and also externally for some data sources so that people can pull live dynamic data directly out of one consistent source. So I started by saying we're a small organisation. As a government organisation, we've got less than 200 people. Um, that means that we can't do everything we would like to do in-house. So a lot of our strategy has been based around collaboration and partnership. So we pull in key skill sets from specialists where we don't have that specialism in-house. We also work closely with other government entities. So working with government entities that are in the energy sector and also in the um, marine sector, we want to make sure that the relevant industries are only reporting data once to government as a whole, rather than reporting sometimes slightly different data sets to different organisations for different purposes. So our strategy here is to make sure that we're pulling data from the core source and to make sure we're reducing that burden on whichever part of the industry we're talking about. This is also key as we go forward for energy transition for net zero 2050, because we can start to see a much greater picture of the energy system as a whole if we can pull data in from a number of sources from where it already exists. The other aspect of our collaboration is around more the assurance part of it that makes sure that we're getting the insight from our end users and in terms of data managers, for example, but also in terms of the managing directors and leadership teams that are using those data to make decisions. So we've got a variety of um, advisory groups where we're pulling those skills in. And we found that this is a key element in terms of the culture change aspects of bringing in the insight from people that are working with data and are using data. It enables us to understand 
the behaviours that we want to encourage and the problems and challenges that they're facing. A final pillar then is around influence. So influencing people to do something that you've not fully completed yourself is always difficult. And digital transformation, as we all know, is, is a sort of a never ending process. But we've found through using case studies and promoting the positives where we're seeing good cases of people using data or different technologies to solve problems in a different way is a really good way of getting people in the wider um, system to understand why it could help for them. So we do quite a lot in terms of promoting the, the positives. We also have a number of different forums that we influence through from ministerial led forums like the UK forum, which has recently been retitled the North Sea Transition Deal Forum, through to specific forums working with uh, data managers, for example, to understand their daily needs in terms of the, the systems update. Through all of those influence elements, that's where we start to talk about being a catalyst for change. So actually talking to people about digital data and technology all the time, about explaining how it can help improve their lives and their achieve, what they're trying to achieve in terms of, in particular, the net zero and energy transition agenda, which is the one that we talk about most frequently at present. Uh, that is ultimately the way that we believe that we're going to get the greatest value. So on this slide, just talk about some of the feedback we've had. So in launching the National Data Repository in particular, we opened up data to a wider range of people than had previously had it. The industry had access to this data and they had a, a collaborative system that they could share the data amongst themselves. What we've done in terms of the NDR is actually open that up to others. So anybody on this um, webinar could log on to our NDR site and ask for a user account free of charge. In particular, we're seeing that as being a great benefit to academia, but also the wider industry in terms of energy or where people are trying to integrate different elements of the energy sector. So I thought I'd finish up with some of our most popular and recent releases. The NDR I've talked about a couple of times, but just to give you a, a flavour of what that's about, we've got over 6,000 users. The majority of those are not regulatory users, so they tend to be members of the public, academia or the wider supply chain that are looking to understand the UK basin better. We've had over 760 petabytes of data access since it was launched in mid-2019. And we've started to work on that in a slightly different way. So over the next couple of months, we're launching NDR2, which will use different, more modern technologies, cloud-based um, system that will enable people to use data in the system in a different way and add on what they've been able to do to date. The second one is Pathfinder, is a, a refresh product that we launched a couple of months ago. It's essentially a one-stop shop for contracts in the UK continental shelf. So these are energy-based contracts that people are putting out to tender. The supply chain can access the details of the contract. They can search on it by um, certain areas or certain types of skills. And we're continuing to see an increase in the number of users and the number of contracts that are going onto this system. In particular, the relaunched system has a focus on energy transition so that people can put projects on there that perhaps will reach a wider audience in terms of the supply chain than they would have previously done. The final two areas there are products on our GIS system. So we recently did a collaboration with a number of other government entities and regulators to look at how we can combine all the data that we hold together in a spatial manner with a, a view to ensure that the data was in one place for the energy transition. So this map now includes all of the renewable and petroleum assets in the UK continental shelf the North Sea and you can essentially go in and look at different areas and work out how you might be able to start to integrate different energy types together. The final one here then is our most recent launch. It's essentially a virtual gallery of our most popular 
apps. It enables people to go in and look at some videos on how they work to actually draw directly into the spatial uh, part of the system and access that data. It also includes quotes and tips from some of our internal and external users on how they've used the products to their benefit and how they think that others will be able to do so as well. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to Keith for questions. Thank you, Nick, for an extremely interesting presentation. So as a reminder to everyone, if you have questions relating to this evening's webinar, please type them in now using the Q&A option in your control panel. Please don't use the chat option as your question may not be logged. If you see that your question has already been asked, then you may use the upvote option to flag your interest in this topic. So I'd now like to hand over to my colleague Keith Phillip to address your questions with Nick. Keith. Good evening. Thanks, Keith. Uh, first question we have is, why do you feel that people, skills and culture is so important as first step in a digital transformation? I think it's the most important because without people, you don't achieve any of the, the rest of it. So we all know that leadership teams love talking about AI and machine learning. Um, it gets boards interested. But you yeah. can't do that technology if you don't have the people, first of all, to implement the technology mm -hmm. and secondly, the people to get the data right. So my second part of that is you need the data to be high quality, consistent and as complete as you possibly can do. But again, you can't do that if you don't have the people. So getting the, the digital skills and I use digital in the wider sense that, as I said in the presentation, including agile mm -hmm. in that kind of um, frame of digital skills if you don't get that right you're not going to get the rest right and when you start playing around with digital transformation and it gets wrong we all know that it becomes very very expensive yes okay i've got a follow-on question as well um my first uh, thought was oga was quite a large organization but I think throughout my career, I've always seen producing a report or um, yeah, yeah, producing a report or asking somebody to produce a, a report, use data, has always been a straightforward task to delegate. So heading into a digital transformation, you're using the data warehouses, having that ease of accessibility, a lot of people can now create their own reports access the data themselves, do it for themselves. And it, I I'm really want to know did, how, or did you have techniques to break that traditional delegated task to a, a, a task you could actually do yourself? Yeah, so I think we've, we've taken it from two approaches. We have a few sort of official dashboards yep. um, that oh, are the ones that we use externally. Um, mm -hmm. So we give people that gives people a view as to what's possible, but we then have focused on giving them the skills to make their own dashboards and do their own analysis as well. So by saying to them, actually, we're going to take the maybe the high profile ones off your hands and we're, we've got a, an analyst team that work on those, we're going to then enable people to say, actually, I saw that. Um, bit of analysis that came forward on one of the dashboards. I, I'm really interested in that, but I want to know a little bit more on X, Y, and Z. So we've then given them the skills to enable them with the data coming from the data warehouse. So we know that the data, we don't release data into the warehouse until we know its quality is passes our, our threshold essentially. So we know that people can play mm -hmm. with data Yep. Um, if they want to publish it externally, then we have a sort of a control process to make sure it's gone through the right analysis and the right teams to do that. Oh, okay. Right. Question from, uh, well, unfortunately, it's an anonymous attendee, but uh, what data matrices examples do you collect on culture? Um, 
Culture is a really difficult one to measure, I think, because it's it's usually a qualitative factor rather than a, a quantitative one. We have an exercise called um, the CBQT, and I'm frantically trying to remember what those letters stand for, but essentially it's a measure that we use with the industry around collaboration and behaviour. So we ask a set types of questions of um, an industry operator. We ask them to rank themselves on these criteria. Our team then independently ranks them on the same criteria. And these are questions in terms of how well they collaborate with other parties. Um, we then map that out for them on sort of a spider a diagram to enable them to see where our view as the sort of um, authority differs from their view as the, the industry operator. We then take that into a, a meeting with leadership teams in the two organizations and actually say, okay, why, are they, why do these differ and how can we help you display the behaviors and the culture that we want you to do? I say, excellent answer, thank you. Hey, next question from Richard. How do you get the business to buy into a change in process to ensure the data quality remained correct? Good question. And personal interest here for me. <laughs> I so and I would say, Richard, that I, I don't think you can ever get data quality perfect. If anybody tells you it is, then they're telling a, a white lie, I would say that. And um, I think I think all we can do is make sure it's heading in the right direction. And how we get the buy-in for that is nobody wants to make the decision off the back of the wrong data. So by explaining to people on, particularly if we're benchmarking with industry and we can say, well, actually you could see from this that your industry counterparts have taken a different approach. We can only have those conversations if we've got good quality data. So that, that's yeah. the first thing is the behavioral. The second is we're lucky in that we've got uh, legislation and powers in the legislation that requires the industry to report in certain form and manner, which we dictate. So previously, they would have submitted data to us on yes, yes. cassette tape, et cetera. Now we, we define how they have to submit it to, to us, but and also the format. And we're starting with the compliance team to say, actually, it was great that you submitted to us, but let's be honest, it was a bit rubbish. So we have a lot of those conversations and we say, well, actually, we'll have those conversations first in terms of um, a bit sort of carrot and stick. So we'll have those friendly conversations. How can we help you to improve your data quality? But also we do have regulatory powers so we can sanction people if they don't comply with our, our data compliance. And that, so it's kind of a start with the behavioral but also have a, a bit of the, the stick behind it if needed to be able to get people to understand the importance. I should say though, we haven't really had to use the, the sort of um, harsh powers side of it. We've managed to do most of it through getting people to understand that actually, if they've got better data, then they make better decisions. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Next question from Stephen. Is the Oil and Gas Authority taking an enterprise architecture approach? You know, uh, business, data, app, tech, within the Digital Transformation Initiative. Drivers for Change capture the current as is and target to be. Okay. Yep. So we are, Stephen, have you, have you but we're not- Have understood the question? Because I think I yeah. phrased that quite badly. <laughs> no, 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 I think it's so essentially, are we doing- <laughs> Apologies, sort of Stephen. Following an enterprise architecture um, process. So yes, Stephen, we are, but we're not calling it that. So we, four years ago, we created an enterprise architecture project. Um, we got our leadership team to buy into it with through showing them a whole load of sp spidery like diagrams of legacy systems connecting to each other and not connecting and data going into all the wrong places. We had a few meetings of enterprise, the enterprise architecture project, and then we realized it was dull. And by that, I mean that people didn't want to come to meetings because let's be honest, unless you're really into enterprise architecture, you have no interest in it. So we changed it a bit. We changed the phrase of it, and you'll notice at the top of the slide deck, I'll have called it Digex. That's digital excellence. So we started to talk about it as Digex. Um, that brought a couple more people on board. They understood um, just excellence. They understood digital was a good thing. 
We then stopped calling process mapping process mapping and we called it um, improving workflows. Um, I know it sounds a bit silly, but just the changing the names of things has enabled us to ultimately end up with a, a much better enterprise architecture project. We're not there yet by any means, but we have process mapped, I think, about 300 different processes, which accounts for about 70 parts of the organization in terms of interactions with um, the industry and both in internally. We've mapped that as as is. We've then taken the approach that in terms of the 2B, we want to do that to enable the buy-in on a project by project basis. So we've actually done it when people have come to us and said, now we've seen this as is, we've actually realized it's not very good in some places. So we've got one part of the organization that's entirely paper-based. And we're doing a project at the moment to turn that into a portalized system. We've done the process mapping because the business owner came to us and said, I've seen something that someone else has done and I think you can help me. So we've now mapped the as is and the 2B for those particular areas of the business. I think importantly, though, we also took the decision to not try and do that across the whole organization. So some elements of our system, we said, well, actually, we it's not going to add a huge amount of value. So let's not bug people with process mapping and architectural diagrams when actually they're just going to switch off. So we've kind of focused it to the areas where we think we can see it working. Great. Uh, short question, how do you measure productivity? I don't think we do. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, so uh, that's... Product of it, again, it's a difficult one to measure. It's like yeah. culture or behavior. So mm. we as an organization um, do the usual kind of people surveys or employee surveys or what you, whatever you want to call them. We've taken a decision to do them every two years rather than every year. Um, because people get bored of surveys, really, to be honest. We all know that you start a survey and you're enthusiastic until you get to page 30 of the survey and then you switch off a bit. So we, we've taken the two-year approach. We judge productivity in terms of comments from that. And we've then more recently done the HSC have a wellbeing survey employees can sign up to. We've done that and we've asked people around how busy do they feel they are, do they have control over their work? Those kind of questions to judge kind of productivity in terms of how people are feeling about it. And we then, from a, an organization wide point of view, we monitor projects on uh, Kanban on te through Teams Planner um, to measure our output. So how people are feeling about productivity and are we achieving our output, but we haven't come up with a good measure at all for a, a very metric-based productivity measure. Okay. Back to Richard. Again, we're looking at mapping uh, tools. Did you use any tools to map data line at lineage? And if not, how did you get that correct? Um, so we have hmm. used a tool. We have used a tool called Signavio for hmm our process mapping. Um, again, we haven't required people to use it. So we also mm. have people mapping using Visio mm. and Word documents as mm. well. We've, where people have done that, we've taken it and given it to um, the partner that we're working with who then maps it in Signavio for people. So we haven't required people to learn the system themselves as part of our measure of trying to get people interested and involved in it. Okay. I've got one final question. Um, and this, this is just uh, come through, uh, just get a little, little, uh, feedback from you. What's your opinion of KPIs? Uh, it's not quite data. No, no, it's fine. Um, <laughs> want, we want to put you on the spot. <laughs> if, they, if they're well created and they serve a purpose, then they're great. Yep. If they are done for the sake of a tick box exercise or a checklist, then they serve no other purpose than to annoy the people who have to collect the, the yep. data to calculate them. Yeah. I also find that it, it was, as you, you talked earlier about the behavior as well, people modify their behavior around the KPI. Okay. Yeah, exactly.
Thank you ever so much, Nick. I'm going to pass you back to Keith. We are out of questions. Thanks again. No worries. Okay. Great. Thanks, uh, Nick and, uh, and Keith. And thank you everyone for some great questions there. If you have other questions that we're unable to answer, then please address them directly to one of the panellists and we'll try to address them uh, after the event. So on behalf of the BCS Butcher Branch, and particularly Nick Granger, thank you very much for attending today. Have a great rest of your evening and we look forward to seeing you at one of our future events. Goodbye for now.